asking yourself the question what the university will be in 2025, because that was the initial question posed to me, would not be really useful if everyone agrees that there's no threat and that the university is doing fine. We have this science and transition debate, which uh, Wijnand is, is leading here at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and that is, that's not, um, that, that's meaningful in itself. Um, so yes, uh, the, the question whether we arrive in 2025 uh, is, is, I think, uh, urgent. But I think that the tone of the debate, and certainly in the Netherlands, is, is getting a little bit in, 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 in overdoing things. Uh, there is a kind of urgency uh, which I think is uh, too strong, too strong um, now in, in the publicity. Um, but there is a lot going on in the Netherlands and everywhere and, and elsewhere in Europe. First, let me, let me try to paint two extremes in how we ourselves, as, as faculty, perceive the university, just as some of you will to, to do, do today and tomorrow, but allow me to paint black and white cartoons instead of detailed uh, pictures. I will try to indicate the course that Utrecht University, as part of the Dutch university system, has decided to take uh, in navigating between these two models. Um, I said two extreme views dominate the present debate on the role and future of universities in the United States and in Europe. The first is what could be called the romantic view, what I call the romantic or nostalgic view, and the second utilitarian, utilitarian model in which a university is simply a business. The first entails a kind of ivory tower in which academic freedom is not complicated by dilemmas of daily life in a world in which there is ample money for otherwise very hardworking schoolers and highly talented students, and in which, by the way, the state plays a major role in funding but not interfering in the university choices. Rankings are in that world not really important. And competition for talent and money is not a factor. Here in this old-fashioned ivory tower, the intrinsic value of knowledge is all that counts. And Fritz will talk about this intrinsic value of knowledge. I'm sure that we agree that this world, if it exists or existed at all, is certainly not the world in which we are living today. Many of you take the view that modern universities are at the other extreme and that there are more and more major businesses led by accountants and CEOs who are only looking at production. I tend to think that given the titles of the presentation today and tomorrow, certainly some of you, if, if not the majority, share this view. I've heard statements, for instance, by the president of the American Association of Universities, and that's not, not the first, about the corporatization of universities where the university leaders tend to strive for simplistic, reductionist solutions. In such a university, many are worried about the role of rankings, science and transition, the increasing pressure to publish, the chain of decreasing state funding, which generates steeply rising tuition fees. Look at the UK. Immediately followed by the demand by society to deliver a sellable product for such a high fee. The product then, in that who is a student which can find a job immediately, contributes immediately to society and the local economy, and gives thus value for money, which is a key phrase which turns up in every debate. In this view, universities are forced to act as corporations selling a product to an unwilling government and an indifferent or angry society. As said, many schools and scientists who diagnose the modern university to be as this also see universities' leaders as dull accountant-type managers, and I've, strong, I've read strong expressions to that effect in the Dutch press, at least by some of the participants here in this audience. Ladies and gentlemen, both extremes are recognizable, and both extremes might have some examples, but I believe that we are living in a far more complex society than the ones that are underlying these views. Let me summarize a number of topics of which I'm sure that you are aware, but which I think that we need to account more carefully if we want to consider the future of universities and if we want to design an adaptive strategy as a paleontologist, that was my main, my main topic to face the challenges society will certainly pose to us. The reality of the next decade, namely that there will be a flood of students entering higher education, not only in Asia, but also in Europe, also in the Netherlands. At the same time, the contribution of the state will be decreasing everywhere. Certainly, if calculated per student, and that's certainly the case in the Netherlands, as a function of the steeply rising cost for, for instance, health care. In the Netherlands, we at Utrecht University estimate that we will lose at least 2% state funding each year, 
and it will amount to about 20% state funding over the next decade. And that is a conservative, a really conservative estimate. The danger of privatization of university is therefore not far away as governments are stepping back. And universities increasingly need to raise money from private enterprise and endowments. But the decreasing state funding also inevitably forces a spiral of increasing tuition fees, which will lead to the angry response, give us value for money, I mentioned earlier, and which is loudly heard in Dutch Parliament. Accepting the trend that state withdrawal will persist as over the next decades, also here in the Netherlands, we need to think about generating increasingly more income from private sources, including industry. This forces us sooner or later on the road to valorization, and it depends where you are in this world, uh, but everywhere you see this tendency, and at this stage it might be good, again without much detail, to consider the balance between state funding and valorization and its implications. Western states are forced to withdraw from funding higher education due to, for instance, health care costs. And in such times of tight budget, society increasingly posed the question why states should fund university anyway. Anyway, not, not, not fund, but should fund anyway. More and more it can be heard that higher tuition fees or private funding should do the trick. Society, Dutch society, doesn't believe anymore in the value of university. Certainly, in the, as he has said, in the Netherlands, where there is an increasing disbelief in the value for money, higher education delivers. Again, look what's going on in the Dutch Parliament, and again, look what's going on in the European Parliament. To counterbalance this movement, it is imperative that universities convincingly show that they are crucial elements of society in all aspects of their being. They need to convince decision makers of their fundamental impact on society. And by the way, that's the reason that we as university and William van der Acker in person are in the lead within LERI, the League of European Research Universities, to make the impact of universities on society better visible and tangible. Universities need to convince society of their impact. And that impact ranges from training students to be able to explore intellectual new domains and to be functioning citizens contributing to society, up to research that addresses urgent societal problems. And by doing so, and certainly with the latter, the university shows that it roots deeply into society and the state simply needs university. Only in this way, the state interest to fund part of the university budget will be maintained. It is crucial, since only with that money and private endowments, the university is able to maintain its academic freedom. That is, independence in choosing areas of curiosity-driven research, whether that's a false opposition or not, for which industry doesn't yet want to pay. So the balance between state funding and valorization is essential in order to keep the university at even keel. Again, Utrecht University, an example, we generate more than 40% of our income out of non-government sources and are 60% government funded. Although we wish for more, with this 60%, which is generous compared to other nations and states, uh, although we wish for more, with this mix, we are able to invest over the next three and a half years 26 million euros additionally into curiosity-driven research. We were able to invest about 50% of that money into the humanities and social sciences because we think, as university, that these areas are essential in terms of fundamental, fundamental research, but also to society. With that money, we funded themes as institutions and youth and identity, two of the four major themes we put all our money into. And in that context, I think there's a huge future for humanities and the social sciences, certainly if new interdisciplinary themes are developed. It's clear that in the future we need money from private sources, including industry. Is that a risk? Yes, this poses risk in terms of academic freedom, but most of all in terms of research direction. And therefore it is essential to maintain a, a mix of fundings and also for Utrecht University to substantially improve our income from endowments in spite of the bad and the uh, tax regulations we have in Europe and certainly in the Netherlands. 
Utrecht, plans, Utrecht University plans to have a five-fold increase of this so-called, what we call, fourth money stream, money stream over the next five years. But it will be a huge, huge task and will be virtually impossible given the economic climate. I've outlined that the, the, I've outlined that the good financial mix is needed to maintain our academic freedom and at the same time to be rooted properly into society, which I think, and that I agree with the science in transition movement, <coughs> Um, is, is, is really what is urgent also for our university. But next to a healthy participation of the states and a substantial valorization, there's a third element in the future which is equally crucial. Who says that in the future our business model remains valid as far as students are concerned? The business model now, if, if, if you want to talk in terms of business model, I think probably that's the wrong way to address, uh, address the, the, the issue, but if we are talking about business models now, uh, we presume that students are prepared to pay tuition fees and increasingly high, so also in the Netherlands, essentially in order to buy a degree, a degree which is still valued by society. But more and more, there's a tendency among students to critically look at the investment versus gain. The outcome is not always favorable. Would it be possible that degrees are getting less important and there's less worth due to changing society, where students are informally trained more and more, due to MOOCs, and other sources of informal learning. We can talk about this for hours, but to give my assessment without presenting any evidence, I think not. I think that in the end, students will want to study at universities, real universities, given the value of being formed in communities, interacting with other students, receiving high quality education by teachers who are really involved in groundbreaking research themselves, to be really and truly trained. I think that MOOCs or the forms of e-learning will never be able to provide guaranteed quality. MOOCs are, in my view, interesting PR tools, but again, the business model is at best unclear and the quality of the product highly questionable. But it is crystal clear that students in the University of 2025 will demand personalized teaching programs, high quality training, and a degree which really makes them truly functioning and contributing citizens. Hence the citizenship in the Center of Humanities, I think, is very important. Finally, the fourth and final aspects that I briefly want to touch upon after discussing briefly stage finance, valorization, and teaching. And this aspect, this fourth, is close to my heart and I think is critical for survival. Just as for our finances, it is essential to let the university root in society. Just as essential it is to form a high quality teaching environment for which students and society are prepared to pay. A community uh, uh, which is really functioning, an academic community in which there's academic freedom, but at the same time a keen eye for what's going in, on in society. An academic community where it's all about quality and independence, but at the same time not ignoring urgent societal problems. An academic community where quality goes for quantity and where the leaders of universities say we are not judging how many publications you have, but how good they are. I've expressed myself clearly in this respect. I've advocated what I call slow science, and I have a lot of debate whether that's properly coined, but I think that slow science is really something which expresses what I want to see, that quality is all what counts and not the quantity. And I think that in order to survive, we need to keep balance between the ivory tower model and the utilitarian model. Maintaining a healthy financial mix that valorization is inevitable and we should strive for it, but in balance with our state funding and hoping to convince the state that they need to go on investing. Deeply rooting in society, which is not really the case as one of the questions was Rose put on the table. Keeping our academic freedom, yes, and let quantity prevail over quality. And to perform this juggling act successfully, I've pledged for a strong and vibrant academic community, which forms the foundation of it all. I just said quantity prevail over quality. But you immediately understood that that was wrong. And that's good. That shows that, that you are paying attention to what I'm telling you. So you are a keen audience. To perform this juggling act successfully, I've pledged for a strong and vibrant academic community which forms the foundation of it all. And I'm, I'm really convinced of that. It's a foundation for excellent teaching programs, for top research, 
and it is essential to engage with society. But a strong community asks for participation of faculty, of all, at all levels. <coughs> and then we can shape a future and can navigate through the many threats we face. Out of hand statements, and I've read some, and I, glancing at the titles, I also think that there might be bold statements made today and tomorrow, are not good enough. We need careful thought, careful debate, in order to arrive safely in 2025. And in this sense, I'm very happy with this science in transition movement. It is still in Dutch, but knowing why not, I, I think that the website will be in English tonight. Thank you very much. To start with, the, the title that was attributed to me, in fact, the intrinsic value of knowledge, that was probably what they thought that I would bring, and I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to say something about it, but not only that, if you don't mind. And, and then I'll come closer, probably, to the perspective that the other speakers also have touched upon. Uh, well, as you may expect from, from somebody with my profile, a uh, historical perspective uh, to all this, to the idea of the university, appeals very much to me. And being a medievalist, I think, I, I hope at least, that I can count on some credibility if I say that to my strong, in my strong conviction, the university is the most uh, important uh, and valuable uh, legacy that we owe the Middle Ages. Uh, even more so uh, uh, than the cathedrals who are, of course, an, an excellent runner-up. Uh, and I love them dearly, you can uh, imagine. But uh, with all due respect to the cathedrals, they're just a European phenomenon, and you visit them nowadays in awe as the monuments that they are. And you can't do it enough. But comparing to that, the university, of course, has spread all over the globe, is not just a European phenomenon, not at all anymore and very much alive and kicking throughout the globe, not as a monument, but as an active, alive institution. In fact, I wondered, there must have been some examples, but I think it's, it's only very, very rare that a university is closed down. Uh, we see almost every day the other thing, new universities popping up, up everywhere, which in itself only, uh, although some of these experiments may go down uh, or, or downward in, at least uh, sometimes, but that this is, is so uh, illustrat illustrative for, for the success of the concept and the, and the vitality and the vibrancy of it. I think we can't thank the Middle Ages enough for having developed this beautiful institution. Um, over all these ages, of course, since the Middle Ages, the universities have developed and, uh, and changed a lot, a lot. Uh, but in the center, I think, and this is the intrinsic value of knowledge that we touch upon then, I think in, in, in essence, they are still on the same track and they have the same mission that they had in another context in medieval times, which is the love of learning and the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, indeed, curiosity driven by individuals who are engaged in this, in this wonderful passion, this at the essence, combined with, and this is just as essential, uh, I would say, with the zeal and the dedication to educate young, gifted people in this spirit. So it's these, these both dimensions, this pursuit of knowledge and to educate young people. And you could easily also advocate that probably the second is maybe even more important than the first, or at least I sympathize with the idea that the most important product of a university is not citations in top referee journals, but talented, young, educated people. That's our, our absolute core business, but happily we are to combine both in this, in this spirit. And so always, to my mind at least, essentially staying true to this original mission, uh, the story of the history of the universities is indeed a story of a, of a great chain of, of being. Uh, the great chain of science, science being probably next to art, one of the most decent things that man has brought on this planet. 
I think, and contributed. That's a great story indeed. And I think as academics, of course, we more or less uh, realize this, but maybe not, not enough. And we shouldn't be arrogant about this. It's not our personal uh, achievement, but it's the tradition that we work in, and we can be very proud and, uh, about that, I think, and very confident that it will survive indeed in, these, uh, in the long run. Uh, but okay, staying true to this mission, there's also, there's always been, and there will continue to be, uh, the change to different circumstances, different missions, different opinions, and circumstances that, in the meantime, these institutions, they themselves also try to influence and to shape from their part. It's not only reacting, it's, only, it's also about, uh, about shaping. But this interaction of the university as a system over the ages, and its environment is, I think, in itself a quite uh, smart and successful example of, indeed, evolution. And in this vein, universities will continue uh, to, to evolve and to change over the next 15 years. That was the, time, the horizon that we were presented with. It could have been 25 or 30 or 50, but... Uh, Evolve, they will, surely, and there will be many, many themes, some of them that we don't even realize uh, today, probably, that will be foregrounded, and new dimensions that will be discovered and put on the agenda. Uh, I could name many, of course, but to name only one, and it was touched upon in the rector's uh, speech as well, uh, the role of online education. Uh, uh, I think that, of course, this, this, uh, generally speaking, we can say that in the humanities, looking at the humanities especially, uh, information technology for research has been now very much integrated. Of course, it is under development and under construction as, as these things go, and, and all, the, all the time new initiatives are, are, uh, are undertaken, but we are quite comfortable with them and, and, and used to them already in, in a way. But that's for research. I think on the uh, part of teaching, we still have a very long way to go to really accommodate the possibilities of this, of this new, uh, new technology. The tremendous possibilities indeed. All these distinguished guests that we are having here these, these two days, of course it will be, will be a great uh, enhancement for, for Utrecht classrooms to have them more present occasionally. And, and in this respect, of course, online education can mean uh, a lot, and I think that's a very important uh, field that we are just starting to develop. And next to that, and I was happy to hear that the rector touched upon the same subject, of course this is not the new education at large as such uh, 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 fully. We have to combine that with, of course, and this is a very old tradition, the, let's say the charismatic uh, dimension of teaching which all, all, the, uh, all the appliances uh, uh, put aside, there have to develop personal relationships along the way over these years between every student, I would say, and at least one or two faculty members, and preferably more, that have to inspire also by, by in a charismatic way indeed, showing what it is to, to, to to be an academic, to not just being it for a job, but, but uh, yeah, really being it, existing, living as an academic. And that can be, can be supplied by, uh, by online education, of course. So we have to combine, uh, combine the two, but I think that's a very, very important uh, field uh, that's, that's uh, uh, looking at us. Um, but then, uh, especially for the humanities, I think in all these... Uh, uh, developments, they have a definite role to play, and it uh, is probably useful to underline uh, this a little bit. And for this, I always come back to one and the same quotation, and I'm sorry for those who have showed this quotation to before, but I, ah, it's already showed. Uh, 
well, um, <laughs> I, I was building up an effect, but never mind. It's this, it's this quotation. It's from, from the commencement, speak by, uh, commencement speech by uh, then interim president. He had been president before of Harvard University, but then he was an interim uh, during a, a short period at Harvard University, and, and Derek Bock uh, had a commencement speech in, in 2007. And after having in this long speech, or long speech, uh, after, in, this, in this speech, after having saluted all the achievements and all the progress that uh, technology and science have to offer, uh, he came to speak, last but not least, about the role of the humanities. And I think these are still very interesting words, and even if you've read them before, it, uh, uh, it can be useful to re read them again and, and, and really internalize what he's saying. I think. I think at least it's a very, there are very sensible uh, remarks that we sh really should take to heart. Um, last but not least, how can universities nurture and inspire the humanities? That's of course the question for an administrator and happy the university where administrators really live with this kind of questions of course. How, what can we do to, to, ins to nurture and inspire the humanities? Well, and then. Humanists today often feel neglected and unappreciated. In years to come, those tensions could easily be exacerbated by the growing emphasis on science, leaving humanists feeling more and more marginalized. I think this is a sentiment that quite a few of us will recognize, maybe not on their in their personal heart, but well, if you stand for, let's say, half a day next to the coffee machine uh, at any un humanities institute, you might hear some of this melancholy, and probably it's not wholly unjust unjustified uh, either. That is a feeling that is, is uh, well, I, it's my personal opinion that, that humanities will always and, uh, attract uh, uh, melancholy people. <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, uh, let's say the medical school will attract uh, highly testosterone uh, active, aggressive even uh, people. It's another kind of people. So you see, I've, I, I, uh, I can tell you how the world uh, how it works. Uh, no, serious. Uh, of course, probably that is some, some, some of this gloom is, is, is a humanist's uh, uh, fate probably, but it is a tendency, uh, a feeling that you can, can observe nowadays for sure. But then Derek Bock continued to say, that should not be. The new advances in sciences offer the possibility of prolonging human life, destroying human life, transforming human life artificially in ways that challenge the very meaning of what it is to be human. And in the face of such prospects, the traditional focus of the humanities on questions of value, of meaning, of ethics, are more important than ever before. And then, also very interesting, I think, such questions are extremely difficult. Now you hear it from somebody else. It's not only astronomy or string theory that is difficult. No, the analysis of Ariosto is also very difficult. Such questions in the humanities are extremely difficult for they do not lend themselves to testable theories. You're on your own. It's interpretation or to empirically verified results. They can't offer that, but they are no less essential if we are to make sense of the changes that science thrusts upon us and create a society in which we can all live fulfilling lives, fulfilling lives. So, and this was the conclusion of the speech, far from marginalizing humanities, universities must look, look for ways to encourage humanists to address such questions and then in ways we can all understand that's also a quite sensible remark, I think. Uh, probably we shouldn't, or at least not only, write in jargon-ridden uh, uh, prose, but also in, in accessible, and why not engaging even, uh, prose. Uh, ways we can all understand, at least, so that they, these humanists, can help us build a world in which our scientific advances do not overwhelm us but are made to serve humane purposes. Well, I th 
still think this is very, very uh, uh, relevant. Uh, and also, we see here the president of Harvard University expressing a true need to hear from the humanities, to hear the humanities, to hear their voice. Uh, and in my experience, uh, that is what many people indeed feel, this, this need. They may not always ask for it as explicitly as Professor uh, Bock, President Bock does there, but implicitly, latently, they have this urge, urge even, or need at least, I know, five minutes, that's what I have to go, or they're already passed. Okay. Um, this, this need among this general audience, we have to take that very, very seriously, and it's not... We are not degrading ourselves if we appear, uh, appeal to this need, but we have to, have to do that. Uh, both, we have to reach out to the uh, rest of the university, which in a Dutch system is a difficult thing. We don't have a liberal arts system, uh, so that, that requires some extra effort. But next to that, we also have to reach out to an audience in the outside world, which is very substantial and is to be taken very seriously. So, in the end, uh, I think applied humanities or seductive humanities, and they can also be about 13th century poets, uh, that's, that's no problem, problem at all. There can be deep gratification from a general, uh, with a general audience to hear about it and being told about it with some enthusiasm. Uh, I think these are very uh, uh, important challenges for the humanities, especially in the period before us. Um, we can indeed have our cake and eat it, doing research for its own sake and applying to the outside world. It should be done. Both relevance and curiosity, they go together indeed in the university. And to conclude in, uh, once more in medieval terms, I think that humanity should be a double-edged sword, uh, being very sharp and shining. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Joanna Burke from from London. Thank you. I, I, I want I really really enjoyed both of the um, your your talks. Very eloquent and really and enlightening with this broad sweep. I guess what I want to um, press both of you on is the European context for this. I mean, both of you spoke wonderfully about the need to um, uh, strengthen and indeed uh, support the university. But I wonder what do you think um, is the role of the European university community in the light of universities elsewhere in Europe that are really in crisis. Here I'm thinking, of course, about Greece, where there's just been announced a 40% cut in university staff. Entire sub-disciplines are being literally eradicated. This is not apocalyptic. This is policy, government policy. There are strikes and um, a very real threat of privatization. So I guess my, my question is, is what do you think the role of the European university community is when faced with um, systems elsewhere in Europe that are in real crisis? Thank you very much. Bert. This is not, a, not an easy, it works for me. It's not an easy question. I, I think the, the matter of solidarity between universities and, 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 and faculty all over Europe is, is really, on the table now, the, the, and that can have two types of expression. One is direct help. It sounds, uh, it sounds unreasonable for a university at Utrecht University, which thinks that th these are times of hardship, but we still have quite considerable more uh, and better financial income than the Greek universities, Eastern Europe also, some of the Euro Eastern European countries. Um, and we try, we, we really try as a university to, to partner up with some of these universities and try to help in financial and in kind ways uh, to keep them on their feet. Second, and I think that's, that is also an important aspect of what Fritz, Fritz just um, told, as universities we need to be more visible, also in politics. That means that we should also put pressure on the European Parliament uh, to ask for, for attention for these universities and for, for the university system in general. And my feeling is, and William van der Ark is now involved also in this European debate, and we as Leary universities are involved in this European debate, that in European Parliament it is not, simply not enough information what's going on, and simply not enough, um, not enough idea of how important universities are and how disastrous it is if universities collapse. Um, 
Having said that, the, the means to help uh, are quite limited from the, uh, my university perspective uh, and point of view. And the willingness in Europe to, uh, to help countries like Greece is not really impressive either. So, so that we, we, it, it, makes a l it needs a lot of time and pressure, I think. Is there some, uh, if I may uh, pick up this, this point, is there at the European Commission some involvement in saying, well, it's important that this uh, university infrastructure um, will, will be kept up for in the future, even if for Greece and some other countries it's very difficult to do this, or is this considered to be a national issue or an issue of lesser importance? Mm -hmm. This, this is, at the moment, to, to be blunt, this is considered to be a national problem. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there, there, is a, there is a problem which is interesting, and Robert John Smith, as the Director General of, of, of uh, um, uh, Research, uh, is the inspirator of that. There's an interesting program which is uh, Staircase to S Excellence, where, where the partnering of uh, universities in Western Europe, nor Northwestern Europe mainly, and Eastern and South Europe, is now trying to, uh, to, uh, to push off. But the money in that program is, is a little, and there's no interest at all in this mm. moment to, uh, to pay attention to universities in South and Eastern Europe. Thank you. Fritz, you would like to comment on this? Well, if well? I may add one more thing. Uh, there's this uh, dimension, of course, of, of policy and politics, and probably our American guests must have noticed by now, we in the Netherlands, we te for a lot, we look to the government eh, at first. <laughs> but there's also, and especially I would say in the academic uh, context, there's also the issue of personal involvement. Uh, and maybe that's the good news in here. Uh, of course, European solidarity has always been a, a, a difficult issue, and nowadays it's, it's probably even more difficult the, than at least 15 years ago. Uh, but we as academics might not have such a problem of being, uh, uh, well, uh, or reaching out to Greek or, or, or Czech or whatever academics, because we come from this proud tradition when Europe was, at least the learned community, was indeed a community, much more, uh, and English is becoming the new Latin, huh? uh, so that helps as well. And then you must have noticed, like I did so many times, even if you visit any university anywhere in the world for the first time, you quite soon feel at home in a way because you recognize this is how it works. There are students, there are faculty and, and offices and, and books and, and, and it's, it's quite easy to, to visit another university. So maybe, and I understand maybe your question was intended in that way, we have also an extra responsibility also on the personal level and not only looking at our administrators and our policy makers to, to help a little bit uh, there. Okay, thank you. Another question from the lady over there, yeah. Mm. Wendy Brown, University of California, Berkeley. Thank you also for both uh, talks. They were illuminating and a wonderful way to begin. I have a, a critical question, uh, a question of concern about using ethics as a defense of the humanities. Um, and the compressed version of the question goes like this. If, if the main value of the humanities to the contemporary world and, a com and especially to the contemporary world of production and, and capital is um, solving or addressing ethical questions, one, why can't that be taken care of with a few courses in analytic philosophy? Why do we need you and me and the rest of us? Two, um, what about all, as, all those aspects of the humanities that actually aren't addressed to ethics and ethical concerns? And three, <laughs> why, why would um, scientists and those involved in um, the world of industry and finance necessarily believe or respect uh, an answer to an ethical question about end of life or cloning or pollution or uh, transfer of garbage and nuclear waste and so forth, why would they believe a medieval historian um, to be the credible source for addressing those things? <laughs> Preferably and, not. <laughs> and I guess the, the wrap on that question is that it does seem to me that for several decades we drew on the idea of ethics as the thing that we contributed. But I, I think that's actually been our undoing, yeah. a part of our undoing. 
Okay, but, but I'm happy to clarify then. That was not my intention. Uh, I see ethics, it was in the quotation by Derek Bock, by the way, but okay, I, 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 I uh, adhere to it. But it's only one of the aspects that the humanities have to contribute, and especially when you come to ethics, there are very many more fields that have highly relevant things to contribute, and also many people outside academic fields, I'm, I'm in, uh, inclined to say, Especially ethics is not something that requires uh, a grade or a thing that can be discussed in a much wider context. But on the other hand, the humanities have much more to contribute than this ethical dimension alone. If you want to pinpoint me on just one thing, I would say it's rather the human factor that is that makes the humanities, uh, that gives them their, their identity, and that we shouldn't underestimate to say it in a rhetorical way, uh, the difference between uh, uh, a mouse and Mozart, although their DNA may be quite similar, uh, that's a huge difference. And humanities are also about beauty, very much so, I think, and not only ethics, for sure not. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this is a very interesting thing for debate, of course, because you said, well, a few courses in analytical <laughs> philosophy but these things have been done and the, the results are rather meager in most cases. Eh? That you see that it just, well, okay, you have, sometimes it's obligatory that you do it or an essay course and then you see, well, okay, we have to do it and bye-bye. Uh, eh? So there is a, a lot of, but it was interesting to see that in Derek Bock the, humani uh, yet, uh, the humanistic perspective was completely uh, focused on ethics. Eh? That was. Not alone, I think. No, what it means to be human, it, it was quite, including it was quite, that, uh, that clear. human yeah, is sure. not only about uh, buying, selling, uh, and dying. Huh? Uh, it's, it's a little bit more to it. Yeah. That's how I understand. I think we have time for one question more. Yeah. It was already. Oh, yeah. Okay. Please. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Aglia Obzorskaya. I have background in humanities, but currently I'm more working in the public sector. So uh, I, I'd rather have a comment. Uh, I found uh, very, uh, very interesting some uh, things that have been said, especially this pr private pub versus public funding issue and um, how to fund further, and also the European, um, European debate uh, on um, the taking responsibility for the situation of universities. And um, to me, is, isn't it rather a question of more deeper question of ownership of the issue. If we're talking about social responsibility, so isn't uh, what I see now currently is that various interest groups or various like intellectuals or, or public sector or officials or private, they're sort of like throwing to each one another this issue, it's like who, who owns the issue of the social responsibility? Who is actually responsible? And what I'm saying is that wouldn't be a way to finally try to overcome this distinction with what is public uh, funding and what is private funding. Public fund funding, to me, is my taxpayers, it's taxpayers' money, right? Isn't it a way to try to, to overcome this distinction paradigm, first of all? And then another thing about the European uh, thing, uh, it's a very much a politics thing, because of coming also having, experience, having had experience in the European Union setting, it's for instance in the European Commission, it's so much often said, okay, so education, we have to, to keep it in the national narrative, education, uh, because it's basically that's the way the member states still can feel ownership over their own policies. So it's not even the problem of the education systems or what education actually needs or intellectuals actually needs or the society needs uh, in terms of intellectual contributions or, or development. But it's actually just, you know, that the politicians or the member states would have ownership in somewhere. So we are on the, and then the European policies are put into a situation that, okay, so from behind, we still want to contribute. So then we invent cooperation programs or something like Erasmus or something, where at the end of the day, that's how they contribute to to, 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 to member states' policies, but there's still this kind of a phantasm of like, okay, so you have the, your own ownership. And isn't it these kind of issues that we have to actually more, on a more deeper level talk about? Thank you. We'll see you.
Which one is first, Bert? I, I, I will try, and then the, 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 the remainder of the, the answer will come from Fritz, probably. I, I'm just, um, let's start with the previous question about whether ethics would be um, the, the only thing which makes humanity shine. As a simple paleontologist, this is always entering a minefield for me when talking about humanities and the value of humanities. Um, I, I think there's a lot which makes humanities very worthwhile, as, as Fritz showed, but the ownership is essential. That was part of my argument, that ownership, that society and governments and European Parliament as well, should feel an ownership, and ownership can only be generated if, if people see the value of things, if they, if they want to be owned. And there is indeed in, in Dutch and European politics a tendency to step back uh, in, in funding universities, but also a step back in ownership. But one of the happier moments in my life was the acceptance of Horizon 2020 in European Parliament, where I must say that European Parliament took a much better stand than Dutch Parliament if, if, if investing in, in knowledge is involved. It is 80 billion euros, and there the humanities and social, scientists, social sciences are put on the map. And that's for the first, first time. So there, there, I think, Dutch Parliament could take an example uh, in, in, in feeling this ownership. But on the other hand, we need, as universities, contri to, to contribute to, to, to let this ownership grow. We can't say, just fund us because we have beautiful science. We need to show, really, that, there, that we deserve that ownership. And I must say, I'm not, I'm not so pessimistic about European Parliament. I'm, and I made that rather clear. I'm, I'm rather pessimistic about the Dutch political situation. But that's, that's a different <laughs> cup of tea. Well, it's a very, very deep and, and important question that you, that you raise, of course. Uh, in medieval times, uh, universities were owned by the church. I think, and, and of course there are still countries where this is more or less uh, a fact. I don't think we have to go back to that situation. Nowadays, and, and our rector seems pretty happy with it, we are in a system, here at least, where the universities are owned by society, represented by an elected government. That's our system. And indeed, I, uh, just as you, I'm, I'm quite happy with that system as such. I don't envy in every respect these American universities that are leading every ranking, and, and probably justifiably so, uh, these private universities, of course, they can uh, achieve tremendous things. They, own, they have their own ownership. But that has also brought about, if I may say that, that, that an American education at a university like that has become incredibly expensive. And, and well, uh, $60,000 a year uh, or whatever. Uh, I, I, if I may, I... I, I um, doubt whether that is good for society at large, that your best institutions are so expensive. Then, in this respect, I prefer, <laughs> if I may say, the Dutch system where we take for granted that, that government more or less governs or at least uh, directs universities and then in a very civilized way because we are still quite autonomous in choosing our own strategy, in choosing our own fields and especially in choosing our own, our own people, so our, our own faculty. So that's a, that's a quite healthy system, but it has to be guarded. You're quite right in stressing that because it, it has not always been like that and it, it's not a guarantee that it stays like that. Okay, thank you very much. I'm so sorry, but we have to uh, to close down this session because otherwise the whole program gets in, uh, gets into problems. Of course, thank you very much. I think we have. Well, Rosie started with uh, raising many many questions uh, to be answered in these days, um, and also in, in during your talks, it was clear that there are more and more questions coming up, also from the audience. Um, I think in the, the next day and tomorrow that will be uh, further discussed about the, 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 the future of knowledge, the future of the universities, the future of how universities work and proceed and how they are funded, etc. Uh, well, we have some, uh, so, some ideas about this, some new ideas, some ideas which uh, go back in history and I think, yeah, the legacy of the, of the medieval times is a very interesting idea and that it's become so global, so universal um, in, its, in its work. Um, and also the stressing of the, 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 the importance of uh, most universities start to see themselves as, more, more as, as research based. In fact, they are, but that their mission 
in many cases, is to educate younger generations, not to be scientists, but to be useful persons, persons who really contribute to society and to the welfare of, uh, of the people. That's one of the ideas behind the humanities, is one of the ideas behind this conference, and also by, by taking up the issue of what was entailed in the Treaty of Utrecht as a certain kind of start of not making war, but starting to discuss and to debate and trying to get to, uh, to an agreement with each other. We have to close down. Thank you very much for this. I gave the floor to Rosie again uh, to close down this session. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.